this church. My name is Pam. I'm your liturgist. George Finley is not working. I need to stand over here. George Finley is our worship leader. Austin is with us with music. George, you're going to Dutch Flat and at Placer Hills? George again. Okay. <clears throat> Now would be a good time to silence your cell phones, and I'll have to remember to do this. Our call to worship from 2 Chronicles 20, 21. When he had taken counsel with the people, appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy splendor as they went before the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for his steadfast love endures forever. Our opening hymn, Joyful, Joyful, page 89 in the hymnal. Son of confession and gratitude, O come to the altar.
Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now time for joys and concerns. David. So first, let us um, give thanks to the Lord for your brother's surgery going well. And Mike, thank you. Uh, let us give thanks to the Lord. And as always, a prayer for the people all over the world who are affected by wars and suffering. And we pray for the softening of the leaders' hearts. Lord, in your mercy. So we have three joys. Maddie, I'm glad to see you. And for Austin being a professional now, and for mom being in a care home, um, let us give thanks to the Lord. But mom also needs our prayers. Um, Lord, in your mercy. Rosie. Okay, for Jim and Carolyn as they travel and drive a lot, Lord in your mercy. Oh God, Wally. So we'll call it a joy, Wally. <laughs> we're we're glad that hat fell down. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and, <laughs> and also for your daughter wanting to have a relationship with you and coming to visit with her family. Let us give thanks to the Lord. Praise Sabella. Be so, so we're glad that Kevin is healing and making progress. Let us give thanks to the Lord. Praise Gail. So prayers for Lily and her upcoming surgery. Lord, in your mercy. So prayers for Cameron. Lord, in your mercy. George. So Virginia Wolf's um, service. Let us give thanks to the Lord. Maddie. So prayers for Gary and his recovery. Lord, in your mercy. Rosie. So we need to pray for Matt's son uh, who lost his dad. Lord, in your mercy. Sabella. Um, okay, traveling mercies for Sabella and her daughter Carla um, as they go to visit uh, a longtime friend and grandson. Lord, in your mercy.
the ushers please come forward? song of preparation, I love you, Lord. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> All right. Yes, George, thank you so much for uh, the service yesterday. Um, it was beautiful, and it was, it was uh, you know, some services can seem so formal and so rigid and stiff, and I just love the way that whole service was. The music, Heidi and Mark and George, it, it was just, uh, it was really wonderful. And Virginia, she was and is a spectacular woman. She was very, very encouraging to me. Um, she would give me hugs and just tell me how much she appreciated me. And I really needed that in the beginning. You all know, and you all were the same way. So uh, <clears throat> what a spectacular lady. But thanks again, George. Appreciate you very much. All right. Well, in preparation <clears throat> for communion, Hebrews chapter 13, I, I look at Hebrews as basically the... Uh, oh, I mentioned that word exegesis last week, just the unfolding of the new covenant. That's what it is. It's a beautiful book uh, of the unfolding of what Jesus said when he said, this is the new, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. And Hebrews takes that beautiful truth and spends 13 chapters elaborating on it. <clears throat> that the whole thing is about God creating these two covenants, old and new. And it says in the very first chapter that he created the ages. Uh, the old King James, unfortunately, has a pretty poor translation. It says worlds, but the Greek word is eon, right? You know how we say eons and eons and eons, right? just means ages. That's what it means. Well, so here in chapter 13, 
uh, the writer of Hebrews, which I kind of think is Paul. Some people think it was Timothy. Some people think it was Apollos. Regardless, I, I think we can all go back to the fact that it was written by Jesus. <laughs> so listen to this as we prepare our hearts for communion. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings, for it is well for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by regulations about food, which have not benefited those who observe them. We have an altar from which those who officiate in the tent, or he's referring to the t- temple, have no right to eat. Whoa, what a shocking statement. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, watch this, Jesus also suffered outside the city gate in order to sanctify the people by his own blood. Can I get an amen? Amen. That's beautiful. Now, at first it might sound rather difficult. What's that wording? As we've studied before, remember in the Old Testament, they would offer up all these sacrifices, these animal sacrifices, uh, once a year, what we have come to know as Yom Kippur, they knew as the Day of Atonement. Once a year, that high priest would take the blood of these animals and offer it up and go into the holiest of holies behind this very thick veil, right? And only he could go there. No one else could go there. And he would go there only one time a year, and God said, don't go any more often than that. (laughs) Don't do it, or you'll die, right? So God was very strict about that. Well, what they would do with the leftovers, the gross parts, the disgusting parts, is they would take them outside the camp and burn them. And isn't it fascinating that they took Jesus And led him outside the camp. The camp was Jerusalem. And they took him outside the camp as if he was the the scum, the leftovers. And they crucified him on what they call Golgotha, which is translated as the place of the skull. Right? In other words, you deserve to die. You deserve to be linked with the scum and the offscouring and, and the dregs, that which is not acceptable to God. That's how they viewed Jesus. And he says that they were officiants and that they were, during that time that this was written in the, in the 60s, first century, that they were offering up all those sacrifices and it says they don't have any right to eat at our altar. And what he's saying is that Christ is our altar. Amen? You know, it's fascinating as we have seen this before that Christ is our high priest. He is our sacrifice. He, Revelation says, is our temple. We dwell in him. So he's all, he fulfills all of these beautiful types that were Diversely fulfilled in the Old Testament. Or at least addressed. What a fantastic minister, amen? He covers it all. In other words, that's what the Bible is saying when it says, all things are fulfilled when we are in Christ. He offered up himself, his own blood, to remove sin. And it says, bulls and goats can't take away sin. They were types and shadows looking forward to what Jesus would do. And he says, remember in chapter 10, in all those sacrifices, all that blood and all that stuff, he says there was a remembrance of sins. It was to remind you, you're a sinner. You're separated from God. You can't go into the holy place. And Jesus comes along as the perfect, eternal, once for all time sacrifice and says, it worked. Come on in, fellas and fellettes. Is that a word? That's the first time I've ever said that word in my life. Let's say it's in the dictionary. (laughs) Wouldn't that be funny if you looked it up in Merriam-Webster and it was there? He'd say, whoa, George is a prophet. Anyway. (laughs) 
All right, but let's take a look at something. It says, don't be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. Now, our first thought might go to Buddhism or it might go to, you know, Confucianism or Zoroastrianism or any of these weird isms, right? But notice what he contrasts it with. Strange teachings, what? Not by regulations about food. He's addressing the mindset of the self-righteous Pharisees and Sadducees who were all caught up in dietary laws and regulations and rituals and ordinances under the Old Covenant. And so Paul, I think he wrote Hebrews, Paul writes this, we must no longer be children. In other words, he is equating immaturity in the body of Christ with not being aware of grace in the new covenant. And Wally, thank God you all are reading. Thank God. Don't stop. Be the Bereans that you are. The Bereans searched the scriptures daily to see whether this was true. And again, not to puff up Ruth, but I'm so glad that she has her studies. She's trying to get us thinking that way. Be regular in God's word so that we're not tossed around by all these crazy things that come. And usually the crazy doctrines that come, because all it is, it just means instruction or teaching or doctrine, right? Same Greek word, didaskos, right? It's where we get the word didactic, okay? Just instructional. You educators, we have a ton of them. That's what we did. That's what we did. We were about instructing these kids. So he goes, don't be the children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery. And really, I think what he had in mind is these Pharisees who are caught up in Old Testament laws and not recognizing Jesus has come and put away that old covenant and brought in a new one. He says by their crack, and he said, well, wait a minute. I thought Paul was writing to Gentiles in Ephesians. His primary addressees were Jewish Christians because they couldn't forget that from which they came. They couldn't get it out of their mind. But wait, I know I believe in Jesus, but man, what about Yom Kippur? What about these ordinances? What about these candles that we got to keep lit all the time? Now this is beautiful. This symbolizes the light of Christ, which in the Old Testament, those candles, they did, the perpetual light in the Old Testament symbolized Christ. But we don't sit there and go, if I don't light that candle, I'm going to be cut off. That's not our view. Just like this, it represents, the, this was the Passover. But we don't believe this forgives sins. We don't believe that forgives sins. We believe the Savior forgives sins. Amen? Amen. So he says, in, by their craftiness, you say, well, wait, is he talking about Gentile religions? You know, weird uh, Zeus mythology, all that. Let's see. By their craftiness and deceitful scheming. And now watch this in Colossians. Same author. Paul. Therefore, as you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you've been taught, abounding in it with what? That's the biggest characteristic of the believer in Christ. We're grateful. As we've mentioned so many times, when gratitude goes out the door, happiness goes out the door. It does. When gratitude and thanksgiving leaves us, suddenly people begin to see us as dull and dry people, unhappy. It doesn't mean we don't go through sorrows and sadness, but there's an underlying joy that permeates all of us. So beware we need more wares. <laughs> Beware lest anyone rob you. What did Jesus say? The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he was talking about them Pharisees. Beware lest anyone rob you through philosophy and vain deceit. According to the tradition of men, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you are following the traditions of men. According to the elements of the world, and every time I believe that this Greek word is used, elements, it's referring to the law. The elements of the world and not according to Christ. 
For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are what? Complete in him. Don't ever let anyone tell you you are incomplete. Amen? Amen. You are complete regardless of your circumstance. Who is the head, this is Jesus, of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made with our hands, praise the Lord, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. We're circumcised permanently in heart, buried with him in baptism, in whom also, you ask yourself, well, am I still dead in sins? No. In whom also you were raised through the faith of the working of God, Raising him from the dead. You're risen with Christ. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, look, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you of some trespass. No. All. Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. Dang. (laughs) That stokes my soul. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Now he's talking about law. Do you see that? Don't be deceived by these cunning people who bring in trickery and craftiness, which was contrary to us. That's what the law was. It was contrary. And has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to his cross, having stripped rulers and authorities, he made a show of them publicly, triumphing over them in it. He's victorious. That's why Paul said in Romans 8, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Therefore, let no one, what? Judge you in food or drink. Go to Hebrews. What's it say? Don't be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. For it is well for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by regulations about food. And he just sanctions the deal right here. Let no one judge you in food or drink, respect of a feast or of new moons or even of Sabbaths. Amen. Amen. Well, (laughs) this stuff is really exciting to me. It really is. And it gives us hopefully a clear perspective of the real meal. The real meal, which is Christ. He says, eat my flesh, drink my blood. What he's saying is, believe in me, John 6. And You'll never thirst. You'll never hunger. Believe in his sacrifice. It worked. It didn't fail. Your sins have been taken away. All trespasses have been forgiven. So as we sing this song that we sang, Last Communion, it's a beautiful song. It's Andre Crouch. The blood will never lose its power. I want you to remember that. Wally, same thing. And for all those believers in AA, who, who are used to, we, we, you know, we addicts, we're used to relapses, sadly. We're used to it. And relapse can be the most debilitating, discouraging thing. But it's not just substances. It's not just alcohol. It's not just drugs. It can be anything that we have used as a crutch to take the place of Christ. And he just reminds you, when you fall down, look at the cross and realize he forgave you all trespasses. It's done. He did it once for all. Once for all time. Okay? So the blood will never lose its power. If the servers would come forward and will participate, uh, I hope you remember the melody of this beautiful song.